So I guess we can uh, get started. Thank you for joining remotely or in person. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to have here with us today Sebastian Ricciano from the Instituto Patagonico de Geología y Paleontología uh, in Puerto Madryn, a uh, beautiful place that I have. I had the luck to visit a couple of years ago. Um, so Sebastian is a paleontologist, he's a geologist, and he's going to tell us about uh, paleoclimate and paleoceanographical interpretations using uh, ichnodiversity. Thank you, Sebastian, for being here. I just add to this that uh, Sebastian is here thanks to an uh, INQUA uh, grant uh, the International Union for Quaternary Sciences has funded his visit uh, here at Kafoskar University. And together, thanks to this funding, we were able to do some joint work here in the Mediterranean, which will be coupled to the joint work that we did already in Argentina. So uh, thank you, Sebastian. And uh, tell, us tell us everything about Patagonia. Beautiful place. Thank you, Ale. OK. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for staying here and there. Uh, I will talk not just about technology. My idea is to show you a little picture about the Quaternary of Patagonia, including the, some aspects in molluscan, molluscan content uh, and the deposits. It works? No. <laughs> yeah. This is the only thing we didn't check. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Just as a summary, we will talk about the marine quaternary deposits in Patagonia, mainly the molluscan content and the trace fossils developed in it, the regional and local patterns of bioerosion traces. And finally, we will discuss about how climate or oceanographical aspects can influence these bioerosion patterns and how useful are they are to, to interpret path changes. So, but first, why is important Patagonia? Why uh, Patagonia is so interesting to, to study the, their deposits? Some aspects, the important as the Patagonia is the only continental mass of great extension in the southern hemisphere, uh, south of 40 south degree. Yes, uh, just except with the exception of some island, uh, and the connection of Patagonia very near to Antarctica uh, makes an interesting place to, to study what happened during the Quaternary. You know, apart in Patagonia, there are spectacular Quaternary shell concentrations, well preserved, huge extension, uh, and, and obviously unique in the, in the southern hemisphere. But another interesting thing is that a branch of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current surrounds Patagonia, generating coal, coal uh, currents that flows northward. No? Uh, this is the current, and then this branch generates this branch generates the um, the Malvinas current that influences. All the, all the oceanographical aspects in southern, in southern and western Atlantic. Now in this image we have different aspects, the, the, the current model in the south uh, Atlantic, uh, the temperatures, the productivity levels. So all of this is influencing by the activity of that uh, subantarctic waters flowing to the north in this part of the, of the South America. What about the deposits? Well, in Argentina, especially in Patagonia, there is a very well-preserved post-Miocene transgression, post-Neocene transgression. The Miocene deposits uh, appear all along the Patagonian coast, mainly as a cliff. Uh, some Pliocene deposits with patchy distributions, not so representative. But the Pleistocene and the Holocene are very well developed all, the, all through the coast of Argentina. Um, some aspects, very simple. The Holocene is generally more extensive with best preservation, better geological control because it's easier to date. 
And the Pleistocene in general is restricted to Patagonia. Very few localities in Buenos Aires province has the Pleistocene deposits. The preservation is variable. In general, there are some Pleistocene deposits that are highly cemented by carbonates. And there are scarce dating, a lot in progress, mainly with, the, with Ale, the, the, the work of the group of Alessio. Uh, with the, the color thesis mainly that are still in progress. Some pictures from the Holocene. This is for Buenos Aires province at the top. Uh, beautiful shell ridge. Uh, nearly five meters of, of peak with 90% of shells. It's purely shells. It's incredible. And it's very well preserved in, in Buenos Aires province. In Patagonia, uh, these are queries uh, at the bottom. Many of the quaternary deposits in Patagonia are used for roads. So there are queries all along Patagonia that are very useful to, to work because it's hard to, to work in this deposit if any natural uh, deposit or any query near. Some picture of the Pleistocene, uh, both from Chubut, Puerto Lobos, the north of Chubut, Camarones is the central part of Chubut, and in this picture show a typical situation in the in the ridges, with a mixture of sand, pebbles, shells in variable proportions, and the sedimentary structures in some quarries uh, depends on the on where the query is respect to the to the shell ridge. Now it's, it's in the middle, it's in the in in the back of the ridge or, or which part. So more or less this is the situation reflected in through all the Patagonian coast with the, with these quaternary deposits. A little bit about the biogenic content. Uh, many more, more or less the 90% of the, of the content, the biogenic content in these ridges are uh, the mollusk, yes, and there are other uh, groups, uh, but scarcely, scarcely represented. I will show you a little bit about the, the molluscan patterns uh, using this database already published a couple of years ago. Um, to show you the Patagonian and the Bonaerensian, two different uh, associations of mollusk in Argentina, and some interpretations are grouping uh, into, into these patterns. So on the left, there's the localities, uh, then from modern Holocene and Pleistocene, the three ages with the variation of diversity uh, from north to south, yes, from the left to the right. And in general, uh, the modern distribution of the mollusk is quite similar to the mid-Holocene pattern. Mm? And even when, when the Pleistocene show a different, a different distribution, uh, at all ages, the molluscan biodiversity decreased southward. It's very similar to happen in the northern hemisphere where the molluscan diversity decreased to the pole, so to the north. In this case, in, in South America, is uh, a decreasing diversity to the south. But more interesting is to, to watch this with different statistical models PCA or cluster analysis, where it's very clear the distinction between the Patagonian faunas and the Bonaerensian faunas. Yes, bon 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 Buenos Aires province to the north. These groups are very, very well separated in, for all the mythologies. And in graphic C is for modern. Uh, Graphic B is for Holocene and D is for Pleistocene. And 
other aspect that is interesting is the position of uh, Sao, which is San Antonio Este. San Antonio Este is placed at northern Patagonia. It's the limit between the Patagonia and the Bonaerensian area. And during the modern and the Holocene in C and B, San Antonio is very near to, to Buenos Aires. The, the, it's the first Patagonian locality related to the Bonaerensian fauna. While in the Pleistocene, San Antonio moved into Patagonia and all Patagonia is more connected as a whole, as a, as a unique association, uh, different from the mid-Holocene and the modern. And, and, and other interesting aspect is that some localities, some uh, two, three, or four localities in general, uh, forms like clusters that always uh, works as, as the same. Yes, they are together uh, in different ages and with different combinations of mollusks, just bivalves, just gastropods, and, and so on. More about the, the, the molluscan content. Uh, in this case, on top, there is a sclerochronological studies, but it generally reflects short-term variations of climatic tendencies. Uh, that is not my, my idea to, to go deep in this, uh, with this presentation. I prefer to talk more about the, the other graphic in the bottom part, which is a carbon stable isotope of 288 shells uh, of the same species, in this case Prototaca, it's a bivalve from Patagonia, very typical. And you have uh, in blue the modern, in green the mid Holocene, and in black the late Pleistocene. And it's very clear that the that the tendency in the modern and the mid Holocene is quite similar, but it, during the Pleistocene is totally the opposite, the distribution. No? All the samples are placed from, from north to south, and this uh, work is concentrated only in Patagonia. So these are all shells from Patagonian localities, places from north to south, from the left to the right, and in modern Holocene and Pleistocene. And the, the tendencies, the general tendency is, is very different from the Pleistocene to the, to the most recent ages. Now I will start to the technology. Maybe someone or some ones are not so common with the, with the technology. Uh, the acknowledge the study of trace fossils, which represents the activity of different organisms on substrates where they live. Depends if hard substrate or sandy substrate or where, where the, the organism is living. Um, but erosion traces, in, in particular, shows the, the capacity of some taxonomical groups of erode uh, hard substrates by physical, chemical, or combined methods. Uh, in many cases, which is important for ignology, reflect the presence in the fossil record of organisms that haven't had parts to be preserved, like many annelids or some rhizoans. And it's an important tool to reconstruct paleocommunities through time. And what we, we will discuss here is if they could be indicative of paleomarmental changes. I will show you a case study about one gastropod. The name is Crepidula. And we choose this gastropod because it's constant through all the Argentinian coast. Uh, it's abundant in, in the marine environment, excellent preservation, abundant by ocean trace fossils uh, on this gastropod. Uh, and very important, using just one taxon, uh, limiting the controlling factors 
like, for example, it's not the same to watch the bioerosion traces on uh, an epifaunal gastropod than an infaunal bival. It's very different, the life mode, uh, where they live, and so the trace is recorded. Uh, one problem with this gastropod is in Buenos Aires province, just in the Holocene, but I will talk of Patagonia, so it's not, no, not our problem today. These are the traces, the names no, is, are not important. The traces uh, reflect mainly three, three ethologies of the trace makers. Uh, the, pred the predation traces, the dwelling traces, and traces for fixation. Mm? And just very short, the typical traces of oignus made by carnivore gastropods and cephalops uh, is, a, is a predation trace. These rounded holes are for the, the gastropod do for eating the, the Bible. Idamena, very common in Patagonia, is one of the, the traces made by Brosoans. All of, all of these are the chambers, the small holes are the chambers, interconnected into the shell by, by tunnels, traces of Domitnia. The same for uh, Penatignus Idamena, the three. The, these three traces are made by Brosoans. The difference are the, 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 the shape of the chamber and where the chamber stay in related to the, the internal tunnels of the, of the Bryozoan colony. Mandropolidora and Caulostrepsis, two traces made by Anelis. Yes, in general, spionid worms, which in many cases are parasites of the, of the molluscan. Of the Molluscs, um, and also traces for Domignia. Entovia, which is the trace made by Polyphers, uh, is similar to the traces by, made by Bryozoans, but is bigger chambers and uh, is more, more invasive in general. Traces of fixation, in this case, the, the, um, the bryozoans uh, don't penetrate into the shell, just fix on the surface, and when the, the chamber uh, out uh, left the scars of this fixation, uh, which, has the, which are the, the marks on the left, uh, on the left picture, And the last two traces, also for Fixignia, are uh, Podignus, which is the trace made by the pedunculus of the, of the bra brachiopods attaching to another shell. Could be a brachiopod or a bival. And Renignus, which is a trace uh, named for gastropods, mainly in the in tropical waters, but in Patagonia, uh, in general, shows also the, the activity of an elite. But for forgotten the, the names, what is more interesting is to, to separate all these traces with uh, the trace makers. So separate the, the traces made by Brazoans, by Anelids, these are the most representative in Patagonia, and others, like other mollusks, sponge, brachiopods. Uh, why this is important? Because the, the, the environmental factors affect the trace makers. So the trace makers change his behavior uh, and we can interpret this with the, the patterns of how they generate the bioerosion traces. So I will show you now the patterns 
through time from late Pleistocene, mid, mid Holocene, and modern, and in space we separate Patagonia in two in northern and southern Patagonia to just to 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 talk about the these patterns of distribution. These are the the diversity patterns, yeah, the diversity of trace fossil and the ignodiversity uh, from Pleistocene to, to modern and show the number of ignotaxa in one locality and one particular time. And in general, in, in, in all the ages, uh, there, is, uh, there is an increase of the trace fossil diversity to the south. In this case, is the, the shells with traces, yes, it's the, the number of the total shells with by erosion in brown and without by erosion in green. The three ages and northern Patagonia and southern Patagonia. No? And in general, there is also an increase of the number of by eroded shell uh, southward. So what what can can we say about this? You know, what, what what we use to interpret these patterns? What we do is to analyze the modern pattern, the same uh, we do with with the bivalves or with the mollusk, and in this case with the ignology, the pattern of the modern distribution, in this case of trace fossils, and the modern conditions in the southwestern Atlantic. So we analyze the, the main current systems, the temperature, the salinity in, of, through, the, through the Patagonia, uh, the productivity levels, the fronts, very important. There are a lot of oceanic fronts working on, on the Patagonian coast, salinity fronts, thermal fronts, uh, tidal fronts, and the substrates. With all of this picture, we use to, um, to interpret and to try to interpret uh, how the, the modern distribution of trace fossils uh, is conditioned and to generate the implications to the mid Holocene and the Pleistocene. So the general uh, aspect, the general uh, result is that there is an increase in the ignodiversity and by erosion intensity to the south. Yes, most of the erosion structures uh, observed at high latitudes, yes, especially in southern Patagonia, are produced by bryozoans. Yes, yes, these traces are the, the, the most common in southern Patagonia and there are a lot of shells by eroded by bryozoans. So at present, it's very well documented that the diversity of bryozoans and the activity of the bryozoans is highly conditioned by uh, cold, cold waters and productivity, so the nutrients. So in general, in the modern, uh, in the modern Argentine Sea, bryozoans are more abundant in cooler and more productive waters. So this is more or less how the, the oceanographical aspects modify the, the behavior of the trace makers and then the trace maker, how they biroded the shells in modern. So we could synthesize for the modern that the ignodiversity uh, increased by bryozoans, which are more abundant in colder waters, and productivity, many times related to coastal fronts. Uh, and this is different from the molluscan biodiversity, which in general decrease to the south, the molluscan. But the, the ignodiversity uh, is higher in southern latitudes than in the northern, because there are many groups that work in, in cold water, and especially productive water with a lot of food. There are a, a lot of organisms that generate trace fossil in, in this scenario. So back to this, to this graphic. Uh, on top, we have the Pleistocene and Holocene with 
little, little amount of shells with by erosion and the you know, diversity. If you watch the Pleistocene uh, in northern Patagonia and southern Patagonia, the, the brown area increased a lot and the number of Ignacenera also increased. In the Holocene, the, the number of shells with by erosion and the number of Ignacenera also increased. The modern increased a little, but it's the same in the diversity. And the northern Patagonia, the, we could um, interpret the variation of, of, of these two variables uh, just by the disappearance of the traces made by bryozoans. The disappearance of traces made by bryozoans justified the decrease in northern Patagonia of uh, the decrease in ignodiversity and in decrease in the intensity of erosion, which is the, the, the number of shells uh, by eroded. No? But what could uh, be the, the, the dominated factor of this? Well, one hypothesis that made from other works and other sources of evidence is that during the late Pleistocene to early Holocene, there are changes in the latitudinal position of the confluence zone, which is the, the place in front of Buenos Aires today that uh, where the Malvinas current that flow to the north, as it's called, cold current, and the warm waters coming from Brazil, confluence in front of Buenos Aires. And this confluence zone moves lat uh, latitudinally during the late Pleistocene and mid Holocene. So this generates that uh, more influence of the warm current in northern Patagonia and Buenos Aires province during the late Pleistocene and, and early to, to mid Holocene. Uh, this implies also that the southern Patagonia remains under the effect of cold to Antarctic water, at least since late Pleistocene. No? There are no evidence that cold waters arrive into southern Patagonia during late Pleistocene and, and mid-Holocene. Uh, but the northern Patagonia and the Buenos Aires province, there are a lot of evidence of cold waters that change the, the the temperature, uh, interpreted temperature, near 1,000 kilometers to, very similar to southern Brazil today for, for Buenos Aires province in, in mid Holocene. With Molus, I told you about the small clusters that of localities that through different ages works together. I will show you an example of San Jorge Gulf for, for the same but an ignological example. The San Jorge Gulf is in the center of Patagonia, the, where in the northern we have Camarones and Valle Bustamante localities in Santa Cruz province. In the southern Gulf of San Jorge, we have a localities like Caleta Olivia, Mazarredo, or, or Cabo Tres Puntas, these, these places. And I will show you the ethnological difference between those areas. Uh, this is for Northern Golfo San Jorge, Camarones, Bahia Bustamante, same graphics, or same idea to watch the diversity of trace fossils, the intensity of by erosion and using different statistical methods uh, to show the results. The southern, the southern Golfo San Jorge, the same, the more or less the same traces were recorded, the graphics with the ignological content. And I will concentrate just in the intensity of by erosion uh, which show that during the Pleistocene, yes, similar intensities of erosion are registered uh, in both sides of the Gulf. Yes, more or less 
near 50 percent of of shells by eroded the same tendency is is shown for for in both areas during the mid holocene and the modern but with a big difference that the decrease in the intensity of variation is higher sulfur. You now, in this case, it's, it's different from the general pattern. And again, well, what is working here is a, a local combination of oceanographical uh, aspects that generates the northern Gulf of San Jorge and southern Gulf of San Jorge act as a close areas into the Gulf. They are, they are not related. Even when they stay very near and in the same Gulf, 200 kilometers one from another in the middle of the ocean, but the local condition of mainly productivity and the salinity fronts coming from the, from the south, yes, uh, generates that these two areas uh, are very different in their in their in their trace fossils and in other aspects. In this this work is about uh, plankton. So as a summary, the marine paternal deposit of Patagonia show excellent preservation, rich in molluscan fauna uh, on these shells. Diverse trace fossils content can be observed. There are latitudinal changes in the bioocean pattern register, which could be explained mainly by sea surface temperature and productivity at regional scale. But in local, at local scale, some of the oceanographical conditions can generate clusters into Patagonia that act different during in different ages and in different places. And the bioerosion traces can be potentially used for analyzing marine changes, like temperature, salinity, productivity, other through quaternary history uh, in Patagonia and the Southern Atlantic, at least, but could be used in other contexts. So, thank you. <clears throat>